Welcome to Ask an Atheist. I'm Annie Laurie Gaylor, co-president of the Freedom From Religion Foundation, and this is the debut of our new interactive program, Ask an Atheist, where you can participate, whether you're a believer or whether you're a non-believer of whatever you call yourself, an unabashed atheist maybe, or an indifferent agnostic. I'm Dan Barker. I'm co-president of FFRF. I'm a former evangelical minister who just lost faith in faith. In other words, I saw the light, and, and now I am a born-again atheist. And I'm Andrew Seidel, also an atheist and a constitutional attorney with the Freedom From Religion Foundation. And in every weekly program, and you can look for us at the same time, same place, staff from the Freedom From Religion Foundation will tackle a controversial, thought-provoking, or topical subject. Usually having to do with free thought and non-belief, the rejection of religion. On future shows, we'll talk with other issues like how can you be good without God? Or maybe, how can you have purpose in life without God? Or happiness, or the Bible, or some of the apologetic arguments like evidence and so on. Maybe the problem of evil. And Ask an Atheist will also deal with the common myths about America being a Christian nation, or about some of the controversies surrounding the separation of state and church, something that we know an awful lot about here at FFRF. After we make our case, uh, then we're going to open it up to you. You can send us some comments or short questions and have a little dialogue. You can just do it right there on your Facebook right now. And for the debut topic, we have chosen a perennial favorite. What's wrong with the Ten Commandments? And the answer is, of course, there's a lot wrong with the Ten Commandments. People think of them as being wise edicts. For living. In fact, they epitomize the childishness, the vindictiveness, the sexism, the inflexibility, and the moral inadequacies of the God of the Bible. Before parsing these ten edicts one at a time, we want to point out that only six of the Ten Commandments even deal with individual moral conduct, and this comes as a surprise, as a surprise to most Christians. The first four commandments deal only with the uneasy vanity of the biblical deity and how he may get you and even your children and your great-great-grandchildren if you fail to stroke that vanity. And we should also point out that there are four versions of the Ten Commandments. There's Exodus 20, Exodus 34, Deuteronomy 5, and Deuteronomy 27. Now, the first set is the set that everybody thinks of as the Ten Commandments, and this is what Moses got after wandering for three months in the desert with no food and no water and climbing a mountain. He heard a voice and attributed it to God. The second set begins with a promise to commit genocide and wipe everybody off the land for the Israelites, and that set ends with a, with a stricture to not boil a kid in its mother's milk. Hmm. The third set is pretty similar to the first set. There are some differences. And the fourth set is just a list of people who are cursed. For this series, we are going to focus on the first set, which is actually not even called the Ten Commandments. That phrase applied, doesn't apply until the second set later on, where the one that ends with not boiling a baby goat in its mother's milk. Hmm. And um, so we want to begin. And with a little help from the so-called voice of God, as depicted in Cecil B. DeMille's 1950s epic, The Ten Commandments. I am the Lord thy God. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. <laughs> that big, deep voice of God is a big, macho male voice. <laughs> now, uh, the Ten Command, the first commandment alone is reason enough why it should never be up on governmental property or on public property. Um, the, f the first commandment is all about the uh, telling you which God to worship, and the government has no business telling you whether to worship a God or how many uh, gods to worship or whether to worship any God at all. Clearly, it's the antithesis of the First Amendment of the Constitution of the United States. It's not religious liberty, it's religious tyranny. Now we have the second commandment coming up. So this is why it's actually really important to go and read the Bible, even if you're an atheist, because if you continue reading this commandment, it actually says that God will punish people 
who worship those idols to the third and fourth generation. It says that I will punish children for the iniquity of their parents to the third and fourth generation. So in this commandment, God manages to ban all art, he manages to ban the freedom of religion, and he manages to punish innocent children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, and great-great-grandchildren. So it would be difficult to come up with a more immoral law than this one. Well, that's the epitome of injustice, isn't it? <laughs> I would think to so. To punish children for what their parents did. Exactly. Right? Uh -huh. So let's go on to the third. So for an omniscient being, this God is remarkably imprecise. Now most people interpret this as a, com a ban on one of my favorite pastimes, blasphemy. <laughs> uh, now Bertrand Russell said that every great idea starts out as blasphemy. And while that is certainly true, it's important to note that criminalizing blasphemy, laws against blasphemy kind of give the game away. They make it so that an all-powerful God can't withstand criticism. Essentially, the very idea of God is so weak and fragile that it crumbles under any criticism. And you know what I say about this commandment? Jesus Christ, not this one again. <laughs> <laughs> and Dan, you have a good line about this one well, as well. Well, blasphemy is, it, it's a moral impulse to blaspheme the power because the power doesn't want to be criticized. So basically, <clears throat> since there is no power, there's no God, blasphemy is a victimless crime. And, and side note, we've actually had some success lately at FFRF getting some blasphemy statutes taken off the books. I just got one taken off the books in Edmond, Oklahoma, uh, and, and the Danish parliament actually just removed their blasphemy laws. So we're making progress on Although that Although it's, it's a huge problem globally. It is. And I think Canada and even New Zealand are considering removing it now as well. So number four. So remembering the Sabbath day, that's not a law in the United States. It's not against the law to sleep in on Sunday mornings. In fact, those first four commandments have nothing to do with morality or modern American law. But uh, read on what it says about the Sabbath. The Sabbath was really just to honor the God so that he could be worshipped. But you know what is the penalty? If, if someone was caught breaking the Sabbath, we have an example in the, the 15th chapter of the book of Numbers. One of the Israelites was discovered outside the camp on the Sabbath day, picking up sticks of all things. And so the Israelites says, well, look, it's the Sabbath. He's working. He's not honoring God. What should we do? So they went to Moses and they said, what should we do? We found a guy picking up sticks on the Sabbath. Horrible. And so Moses said, well, he talked with God and Moses said, he's got to die. So they took that man outside the camp and they stoned him to death that he died. The Bible says that always a funny way. They stoned him with stones that he died. So uh, according to the Bible, if you don't go to church on Sunday morning or whatever your Sabbath day is, you should be put to death. Or you do any kind of quote unquote work, which could even just be, um, according to some Orthodox Jews, just unrolling the toilet paper. Yeah, or, or, or like, flipping a light switch. Or like in Los Angeles, they actually have the walk and don't walk things uh, to cross the street automated on the Sabbath so the Jews don't actually have to push the button. Can you believe that? Because mm -hmm. they don't want to be stoned to death right <laughs> on the streets of L.A. You know? <laughs> All right, well, let's look at number five. I think we've lost the voiceover. For I am the Lord thy God. Oh, there we go. <laughs> that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee is the rest of the fifth commandment in this version of the Ten Commandments. And um, this sounds like a good verse. It's, it's a little bit more positive than the rest of the Ten Commandments, but I think there is an inadequacy in it. Um, honor your parents, but let's hope that they deserve it. Should a child who is beaten or uh, raped by a father honor her father? It's couched in absolutes, but there would have been a more important um, uh, commandment when you only have top, the top ten that you're highlighting and that would be parents honor your children. Yeah. Children are helpless. They brought into the world by adults and we as the adults have a uh, uh, responsibility to take care of them. So we should be honoring our children, correct? And that should come first and hopefully we will earn the respect of our children and they will honor us. Now number six. Thou shalt not kill. 
So finally, we get to a moral law here, six commandments deep. So thou shalt not kill is actually the way only some of the religions and Bibles interpret it. Other religions and Bibles interpret this as thou shalt not murder. And the difference is actually pretty significant, because if you can't kill, if somebody breaks into your house in the middle of the night, you can't even kill them in self-defense, versus thou shalt not murder, which might allow for that. And whichever interpretation is used, we have to remember that the Israelites in the Bible didn't really pay much attention to this one, because immediately after they get these commandments, they go on a killing spree. They commit some 70 genocides in the next few books of the Bible, especially in Joshua. So, thou shalt not kill doesn't apply so much to them. And also, the biblical deity orders many Absolutely. of these killings and mass murders. And so, I mean, maybe, Dan, you can talk to this. Uh, some of these commandments are just geared at, at f uh, fellow Hebrews, and they don't apply to the people who are not in your tribe. Well, and actually, as Andrew points out, that word kill in the Hebrew is ratzak, which is an ambiguous word. Those words are used all over the Bible for, even for manslaughter. And how can you command somebody not to manslaughter, which is an accidental <laughs> death, right? So uh, you can't put much stock in anybody's particular interpretation. But the word kill is the actual word there. And uh, the God of the Bible, in fact, commanded, in, in fact, he right away, he said, kill everyone, his neighbor and his son and his... 3,000 of your son's brothers. Yeah, neighbors, kill right? all of them. So kill, 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 kill. It's a bloodthirsty book. And that's right after they get the Ten Commandments. It's when they're worshiping the golden calf. Right? I think God exactly, says, kill right. 3,000 of them for doing that. So it's but, immediately after. But you know what's really funny about this? He puts in this, thou shalt not kill, as if the human race is so stupid, <laughs> it never would have dawned on us, oh, I need some tablets to tell me that there's something wrong with killing. We, uh, cultures have had prohibitions against killing long before the Israelites claimed they had the copyright to this, right? So, so it's there's absolutely. nothing original and nothing requiring supernatural authority here for uh, us to have laws against murder, and we do. We have civil laws that we enforce against murder. So there's one that kind of matches with modern law. What's but, what? but it doesn't derive from the Ten Commandments. Precisely. Yes. It's a universal human principle. So let's go on to the next one. So here again, you have Ten Commandments that you are highlighting, and you make adultery one of them, and you don't mention, thou shalt not commit sexual assault. Uh, that, that to me, uh, and of course the rest of um, the Mosaic Law is full of teachings. There are about 600 or 700 um, Mosaic Laws, not just the Ten Commandments, but these are the ones that are highlighted. And many of these commandments do endorse rape. Uh, so um, there's something very wrong with this. But of course, because this was in the Ten Commandments, and um, the Bible was being imposed on us through law, there was a great deal of suffering because of this um, commandment where uh, people were not allowed to divorce. Um, there uh, are still some antiquated laws on the books. People used to be arrested. It could interfere with your custody rights. So there's a lot of mischief in this. This is a personal decision. Can we really interfere with somebody's uh, decision? Maybe their love has outgrown their marriage. It shouldn't rape the top ten, well, and sexual assault should. In any event, it's not against the law in the United States. No, it should States. not be. It used to be, but it's not, and a, it shouldn't be. A better commandment would be, thou priests, thou shalt not rape altar boys, right? <laughs> Wouldn't that be a strong... would have had a bigger impact, one would think. <laughs> now, we on to the next. Thou sh shalt not steal. Of course, that is another one that does have some relevance with modern American law, because stealing uh, is, um, is basically taking somebody else's property. Although, who defines what property is? In the Bible, females were property. And, um, Humans. And slaves were property. So and there are and prohibitions servants. against stealing someone else's slave. You know, you have to you know, pay back. So um, stealing is general, although this is couched in really absolute terms. I mean, there are, there are situations, should a, should a family with starving children Tell the kids, don't go into that rich person's backyard and take those apples because they belong to the rich person, and these laws are in place. I think, uh, you know, with squatter's rights and that, modern law understands that there are sometimes modifications to an absolute rule like stealing. We don't want to go back to Dickensian times when um, you could be put to death or jailed for years and years as a child because you stole a crust of bread. Yeah. So there's, the problem, again, is that this is in absolutist terms, and it's in black and white, and it admits, admits no nuance. 
So on to the next one. Number nine. So false witness against thy neighbor. Uh, against thy neighbor is an important modifier there because that, that, that phrase neighbor in the Old Testament really means your co-religionist, your fellow believer. So this, this rule says you can't lie to your fellow believer. It's perfectly okay to lie to other people. And there's good reason to think that the your neighbor language actually applies to those previous commandments against theft and against adultery and especially murder. And if, again, we look at the rest of the Bible, we see that it's okay to kill. God says it's okay to kill. He orders the Israelites to kill people that are not following his rules, that don't believe in him. Again, they commit some 70 genocides. So we think that it's probably the better interpretation of this rule is don't lie to people who are your fellow believers, which is a fairly corrupt rule if you can lie to other people as well. And again, you're an attorney. We have laws against um, lying on the stand. Absolutely. Um, perjury. Perjury, is, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes, unfortunately, people have to take, are be, being presented with a Bible to take an oath, but they have a right to affirmation. Everybody, if you're, if you're, if you're asked to take an oath on the Bible, you do not have to do it. You have a, the right to opt out. To ask to affirm. Yep, that's we even do in not the need the Bible to tell us that it's wrong to lie. And again, it's absolutist. Many people tell white lies to save feelings, for example. Mm -hmm. I mean, of course. So, so again, it's just morally inadequate. And we, <laughs> we have laws about false advertising and contractual misrepresentation and those kinds of things, but it's generally not against the law to tell a lie in the United States of America. Yeah. It depends right. on the context. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. So now we're almost done, number 10. Well, we, thou shalt not, you want to read that? Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house or thy neighbor's what property. What would you say? Or, uh, <laughs> hey, it's an active <laughs> Or thy neighbor's yeah. wife. Or thy neighbor's and wife. There is the, or thy neighbor's Slave. ass. Slave or wife. Uh, so, talk about insulting. So, thou shalt not covet. Um, there we go. Um, neighbor's wife, manservant, maidservant. The, the words there are actually slave, male slave, female slave. Nor is ox, is ass, anything that is thy neighbor's. So, you know, it's a good thing there's not a law against coveting in this country or our whole system of free enterprise would collapse. Absolutely. Coveting is something that... Wanting something. Wanting something and somebody's got something. It's, what's wrong with coveting it? What's wrong with me saying, boy, you got, you know, a really nice house there, Andrew. I wish I had that. I really like your shirt. You like my shirt? <laughs> I'll give it to you. Uh -oh, you. you. I'll give you the shirt off my back. But... Uh, um, Th that's the whole problem, though, with this thing, is that coveting views human beings as property. And uh, from the patriarchal mindset, and the, the people who wrote these books were patriarchs who thought their women were property of that. And so it's really about preserving the inheritance and the property of these male Israelites, is what that verse is all about. And, and supremely sexist. And, and one of the things that I loathe most about this commandment, and this is actually might be my least favorite commandment, it's, I think it's hard to pick, but this could be my least favorite commandment, is that it criminalizes thought. And that is the one absolute right that we have protected under our Constitution, but this creates a thought crime, and that is just untenable in our system. So, um, so while this critique of the Ten Commandments um, is useful just in critiquing religion in general, uh, at the Freedom From Religion Foundation, um, we also want to point out that this is another reason why we do not want the Ten Commandments on, in our public property, in our parks, our capitals, even in some of our public schools. And uh, I think that uh, we have some pictures coming up on that in a minute. Yeah, and the Supreme Court has actually handed down a decision from on high, uh, a decision called Stone versus Graham, and they say specifically that posting these religious laws in a public school is unconstitutional because they are religious laws. They begin, I am the Lord thy God. And so we've actually gotten Ten Commandments monuments removed from a number of public schools, including, despite that long-standing decision, we had to file two lawsuits in Pennsylvania to get two monuments removed from the grounds of a public school in Pennsylvania, or several public schools. And that's in big part thanks to our brave local plaintiff, uh, yeah, including do we have, Shab. I, I'm not sure if we have those photos ready. We have photos of those Ten Commandments. There we um, go. There's one, and then we should have, there it's uh, gone. Goodbye. And Is that then New Kensington? Yes, New Kensington, Pennsylvania. And hopefully we have a picture of Marie Schaub. 
There Our she is. brave plaintiff, it says Unabashed Atheist. And she's standing right where the commandments used to be, is that right? An Unabashed Atheist. Who he, was treated very badly in her community. A champion of the First Amendment. Yes. And so um, that movie, The Ten Commandments, that we were showing clips of, Dan, you want to talk about the impetus for that? Well, because the um, Cecil B. DeMille movie in the 1950s, it's really an entertaining movie, by the way, <laughs> uh, for, for, for not for the reasons that they thought. I mean, this high-tech voice of God and the lightning engraving the words there. Um, that movie uh, prompted the granite industry to go in uh, conjunction with uh, Cecil B. DeMille. Well, and they the put e up the these Eagles, uh, Fraternal Order of Eagles. Was, uh, there was a judge based in Minnesota who wanted to promote Minnesota granite. Yeah. So it was kind of a, just a big sales pitch, both for the movie and, and so th the most so unconstitutional sales pitch ever, and for granite. And so, you know, usually when you put up a movie poster, you take it down when the movie's out of the theaters, right? Well, these posters have been up for decades and decades all over the country, and they've got this phony Phoenician writing on them. And in fact, the actors, Yul Brynner, came to Wisconsin to dedicate the Ten Commandments that used to be at the Milwaukee courthouse before uh, we got it taken down. And uh, so, Dan, um, y we're proud. You went and documented that we removed the first such Ten Commandments. I took pictures there. I, in I Milwaukee, we Wisconsin. We should have a pictures of that coming up. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Well, we complained, and it was at the um, city county building, wasn't it? There the it municipal is. municipal hall in Milwaukee. There it is, and there's pictures of it being up, and that's one of those uh, Ten Commandments movies, phony movie posters that was in front of a, a public building. It was the first one put up in 1955, and Yul Brenner, who's got a role in the movie, came to the dedication. And now what are they doing? They're taking it down? And now, then, I, then we got to be there when they actually removed the Ten Commandments, and they've moved it to private religious property. And now let's see that, yeah, there we are, the after pictures. There we go. So a proud moment for <laughs> FFRF. And now we're going to move to your questions or your short comments after um, leaving you with this thought and uh, that the, the Ten Commandments are couched almost exclusively as thou shalt nots, negative scolds, and let's contrast them with the first ten amendments of the Constitution which are known as the Bill of Rights and largely describe positive rights, civil rights, that are left to the people. The right to free speech, peaceable assembly, privacy, to be free of cruel and unusual punishment. And uh, I guess we don't have a visual going up of that, of that Bill of Rights, but... But there is one specific prohibition, a, a thou shalt not, that we endorse very heavily here at FFRF that's in the Bill of Rights, and that is the prescription against the government establishing a religion. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. We Two thumbs up. We have a bumper <laughs> sticker that says, honor thy first amendment. Absolutely. Far better than honoring those Ten Commandments. So um, if you want to learn a little bit more about what's wrong with the Ten Commandments, um, we have a non-tract um, that you can see at our website. Uh, you can order it, and we also have some books. Um, we have uh, Dan's book, Losing Faith in Faith. You have how many? Uh, several chapters about the Ten Commandments. About the Ten Commandments and what's wrong with them. From FFRF, um, my book, Woe to the Women, the Bible Tells Me So, which examines what's wrong with almost every one of those mosaic laws, 600 of them, about women. And also Ruth Green's Born Again Skeptic's Guide to the Bible, which is a very um, erudite and entertaining way to study the Bible. Well, it has 10 complete pages just listing <laughs> the killing that the God of the Bible commanded his own people to do. So, Should we take some yeah, questions now? let's take some questions. So I'm going to have the iPad go in here. But All I think right. I think we have a video question that we are going to submit. And later on for future Ask an Atheists, if you guys would like to submit a video question, please do that, and you may get to be on the air with us. So let's go ahead and do that first. What would you say are the biggest misconceptions about the Ten Commandments as they relate to the claim by Christians and others that they are the foundations of American jurisprudence um, and the Judeo-Christian values on which America is supposedly founded. Thanks. Sure, so this is a hugely common misconception. The idea that the principles filled in the, the Ten Commandments are actually somehow influenced the founding of America. And I'm actually writing a book about this. Um, there's absolutely no evidence to suggest this is the case. 
In fact, it, it really didn't happen. Even though judges say throughout court cases that the Ten Commandments influenced the founding of this nation, it is simply not true. And if you look at those commandments and look at how unfair they are and how they venerate this, this biblical monster, um, I think we've, we know that that's not true. So can I ask you a question, Andrew? Sure. Uh, during the Constitutional Convention, how many times were the Ten Commandments mentioned during that whole thing? N not, a, not a once. And no. the, the Bible was barely mentioned. There were a few allusions, uh, you know, some, some phrases pulled from the Bible, but almost not at all, and certainly not to support any of the principles that they adopted and rolled into our Constitution. It well, just didn't happen. I have a question for you, Dan. How many times did they pray at that four-month Constitutional Convention? <laughs> Well, you hear the story about Benjamin Franklin asking for prayer. That motion was ignored. They did not have formal prayer at the Constitutional Convention. And that shows intent. And here we have all these darn prayer proclamations and a National Day of Prayer <laughs> and a prayer breakfast. And we have a godless and secular constitution whose only references to religion are exclusionary, such as that there should be no religious test for public office. If it was a Judeo-Christian nation, the framers of our Constitution failed to mention it. <laughs> and we actually have a question from Facebook by Edward Ani, which goes into this as well. He said, doesn't the First Commandment violate the First Amendment to the federal Constitution? And absolutely. 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 And in fact, most of the First Commandments violate the First Amendment. And if we actually agree that the don't kill, don't steal, don't, don't lie only applies to your fellow believers, then those commandments also violate the, the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. So you, could, you can make a fair argument that every one of the Ten Commandments violates the Constitution. So if, if our laws are not based on the Ten Commandments, what are they based on? What is the source of American law? Enlightenment values. And I think that's pretty clear. That is something that you see all the time in the Constitutional Convention. Yeah. You see the founders talking frequently about Greece and Athens and all these Enlightenment thinkers. Uh, Montesquieu is a big one. Uh, so it's, it's not from religion or the Bible, which was explicitly kept out and rejected. Mm -hmm. And also, um, it's explicitly we, the people, in the preamble of the Constitution, our nation was the first not to um, give sovereignty to a deity, but to the people. So that's where the power is invested. It's not invested in a god. It's not a divinity that we have a godless constitution. And, uh, you know, that's something that we ought to be proud of instead of constantly deriding as the religious right does. Uh, th we were the first nation to separate state and church, right. and we should be proud of that legacy and not shunning it. No yeah. Ten Commandments in our Constitution. And instead of bowing down to some big alpha male authority figure, we are a proudly rebellious country. We fought a revolutionary war, kicking out the king, the lord, the master, the sovereign, and instead of having some top-down authority, our Constitution begins we the people. It's, instead of top down, it's bottom up. And we should take pride in our rebelliousness of saying no to the big daddy. Absolutely. Yeah. And we, we actually have another question from okay. Suzanne Myers. She says, wouldn't people who use their Christianity for social or political gain be considered to be using God's name in vain? So all, I guess all <laughs> those politicians who are up there preaching for political gain. Cute comment. And yes, and it's all the time. Pandering politicians using religion for uh, electoral purposes. Absolutely, and this is actually one of the reasons that the founders also separated state and church. They, they, James Madison wrote that government and religion will both exist in greater purity, the less they're mixed together. So they're not using God's name in vain, they're using God's name for vain politicians. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Let's see if we got another question here. Hang on. I'm refreshing our thing. So we have Cain, Rakir, he says, why is, that, why is it that most people only know the one set of commandments and not all three of them? Well, because people don't read their Bible, yeah. I think is the answer to that. And actually, here's a fun little tidbit. Uh, when the Supreme Court was deciding two Ten Commandments cases in 2005, uh, it came up that when the government takes a stance on which Ten right. Commandments, that it's taking a religious stance. And, and we put that in our amicus brief, by the way. Exactly, and Justice Scalia the big religious Catholic on the court at the time said he wasn't even aware 
of the four different sets of mm. Ten Commandments. And, and this is a problem with the Eagles monuments that were planted all over the country because most of them are Protestant, but once in a while you'll see a Catholic one, and you'll know it's Catholic because it's minus the reference to graven images. The Second Commandment. And, and the reason they do that is because uh, the prohibition against having a graven image would be engraved on a graven image. You're but not Dan, supposed to do that. As a former preacher, you might want to answer this question too th that was asked. Um, you know, wh why do people only know one set? Did, well, you o did you only preach one set? Well, we always preached Exodus 20 because that's nice and concise and even. And of course, as you pointed out, they edit it way down. They just, you know, if you read the whole thing, you'd see the ugliness of it. But Exodus 20, by the way, the Bible does not say we're engraved on stones. It just says Moses went up the mountain and he came down and he spoke these commandments. And they're not even called the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20. It's only later in Exodus 34 that we actually have a mention of stone tablets. And those are the ones that Moses broke, remember, when he got angry Silly. because yeah. he got really, really mad because God is angry. And so God said, okay, you broke those, so go back up the mountain and I will write again to you the words that were in the first tablets, right? With so, his finger. Yeah, <laughs> with his finger. He wrote on the stone. <laughs> And so, they, they, and it says that Moses carried them down the mountain. So they couldn't have been big like those tablets we saw in sure. New Kensington. They had to be like little stones that he could carry all the way down a mountain. And in that Exodus uh, 34 is where we find the words that were supposedly engraved on the first, which ends with, as you point out, uh, you should not boil a goat in the milk of its mother. Thou shalt not see the kid in, in its, its mother's, mother's milk. And, and what does that mean, Andrew? Well, actually, yeah, I mean, it means exactly that. It's a dietary restriction. It's a, it's a cooking commandment. In and, of course, <laughs> ultra-Orthodox follow that. You separate the dietary from the meat. Yep. You don't eat them at the same time. Yep. And those are called the ten commandments. And that's a really important rule, right? <laughs> well, I know, because I've been tempted to take a goat, and, boy, I'm glad that's in the Bible. You know, I, <laughs> let's see. Let's see if we have any more questions here. Uh, oh, Suzanne Myers asks: Didn't Jesus say that during the Sermon on the Mount not to follow man's law, and didn't he give only two directives that you should believe in God and to love thy neighbor? If so, why do Christians follow the Ten Commandments? Well, most modern Christians think the New Testament fulfills the Old, and that the Old Testament. Some Christians are dispensationalists. They say those rules applied back then during wartime and you had a wartime mentality and so we had to be strict but now Jesus came and he's a warm fuzzy God and now we can just sort of summarize, you don't have to memorize all those 632 commandments, that's what a lot of Christians say depending on what denomination you belong to and so Jesus said there's only two, love the Lord your God and, and love your neighbor but Jesus said I and the Father are one, if you've seen me you've seen the Father and so he identified with that Old Testament God. And when he quoted those verses, you should love the Lord their God, that verse was actually from this wartime genocidal covenant that God said, you, when you get into the Canaanites' promised land, you should love the Lord your God. And if you look at any other gods, I will destroy you. So really, Jesus was endorsing genocide by even quoting a verse about love. Well, and he said, when he was asked about did he support the Mosaic Law, he said that every jot and tittle he must, came to fulfill every jot and tittle right. of the Old Testament. Yeah. So you can't really whitewash Jesus and Christianity and say it has nothing to do with these more brutal uh, Mosaic laws. But you have to because most Christians today are kinder and smarter than the God of the Bible. They would never think of running this country, most Christians. <coughs> and we know there's some wackos over there that would like to. So most of them are smarter and nicer than all of that. And so they have to sugarcoat it and water it down so that it's just a general humanistic principles of loving each other. Well, and this is one of the things that always strikes me about the Ten Commandments monuments that we see around public property and on government property and uh, on the Capitol grounds in Texas, is that they are edited. They're edited to leave out the punishing children to the third and fourth generation. Right. Which or just, even the tenth in one of the versions. And, we, and that just goes to prove that we don't get our morality from the Bible or God. The it's, Bible it, is not very palatable and um, ministers and clergy tend to only preach from the more palatable passages or they excerpt. Well, and that's to their credit, that they are actually ignoring those ugly verses. But why don't they join us in denouncing those ugly verses? 
yeah, they need to free themselves from religion and superstition. Yeah, Get with it. Rather than whitewash, abandon do you, it. Do we have another question, or let, we could let, also talk about the legal status? Let me if check we don't. and see. I don't have another question at, the, at this moment. Okay, Lauren so will probably we, get us we one can take another one. But I thought that we should talk about the legal status, which is murky. Um, Stone versus Graham can't put it anywhere in a school or outside a school. Um, but we had a rather. A, uh, a, tandem was decisions in, the, was it 2005? It was 2005. It was a very bizarre set of decisions. The Supreme Court decided two cases on the same day. Both cases were a 5-4 decision. Justice Breyer was the swing vote. He was the one who changed his mind. And that was a very dismaying. It was. So you had two, one case involved Ten Commandments displays in Kentucky County courthouses. Uh, and these displays uh, were clearly meant to promote religion. They got struck down. The display on the Texas Capitol grounds, also clearly meant to promote religion, was upheld. And the reason that Justice Breyer upheld it was because he said that nobody interpreted this as an endorsement of religion because nobody complained about it for 40 or 50 years. And you have tried very valiantly to clear that record because, of course, the Freedom from Religion Foundation had complained about it many times. Our members had complained. Uh, Mal Murray O'Hare, an American atheist, which was based in Austin, had yeah. complained. She actually asked the attorney general to issue an opinion on whether or not that, that monument was legal, and they refused to even issue the opinion. So here's, here's a very bad decision based on bad information. And Andrew, you've taken some pains on behalf of FFRF to try to clear the record. It's a little awkward, but what have you done? Uh, we actually included a lot of this information in several briefs that we've written to the Supreme Court, including in the court's most recent decision in the town of Greece versus Galloway. And that was the decision that allowed government prayer, uh, which was based on another decision, Marsh versus Chambers, allowing government prayer because we've been doing it for so long. But, but Breyer had voted correctly on those. So we've, got a, we've sent our message to Breyer Gosh, have we ever complained. But that tells us something. That's why it is so important Absolutely. to complain because it, it, look at how it can be used against you if there isn't a documentation that you have complained. Every violation we don't complain about is justified, is used to justify a worse violation. Absolutely. And that's bu actually built into the structure of our common law system. So we, we, if you don't complain now, you're almost giving up the right to win that case later on. You but have the, to complain. But there were four justices who disagreed with this principle that you have to have enough complaint over a constitutional violation to make it illegal. Is that even a valid principle? Well, that, that was Breyer's you know. argument. The real argument of, um, what was the name of this case in Texas? Van Orden. Van Orden. Van Orden. Um, was that, it, that the Capitol grounds were like a museum because there were other things. Well, fine, if they're secular. Um, and that was a real stretch. And Absolutely. so, unfortunately, we were able to start taking down these Ten Commandments that the Fraternal Order of Eagles with Cecil B. DeMille had put up. We got one taken down in Monroe, Wisconsin. You documented the one in Milwaukee. We were mm -hmm. going after it, and then the Van Orden ruling came down. So it's mushy. If it's a new violation, and depending on what else is around it, we are able to stop it. Um, ACLU in Ar uh, Arkansas has one um, get, got rid of a Ten Commandments in front of their capital. So it's still worth complaining about always, Absolutely. Um, but it depends on the circumstances. Because now they think that uh, if there's a Ten Commandments monument, oh, well, let's just put up the Bill of Rights next to it, and voila, this is now secular, right? It's now a museum with all points of view. And they did try to do that in the Kentucky case that was paired with Van Orden, McCreary County, uh, but that was shot down because it was so clear that they were doing it as a sham to as keep the, the religious monument up. Yeah. So it, it remains something it's that fine. we're litigating over, but we never thought, Andrew, that we would ever have to litigate over these monuments in front of a public school. I had no idea they were there, and we did win. It, was, it took a bunch of years and a bunch of work, but we got those taken down in and, Pennsylvania. And we have two more questions, One this too. spring. Two more questions. So I, th I think one. So we have Keith Stevenson who says, is there any evidence that posting the Ten Commandments in public spaces has had any effect whatsoever on changing people's behavior. <laughs> and I, none that I know of. And again, if people actually followed the Ten Commandments that, that are, are written in the Bible, they, we'd have, they'd be violating the Constitution, they'd be violating the law. So um, I, don't, I mean, I if, don't they have, so. if they want to make, they putter around to make a graven image, go ahead. In the United States of America, you are free to do so. But we've also, we've also we do know that following the Bible literally does inspire some awful actions. And I mean, maybe we tell the story, you want to tell the story behind this Bible sticker and that Pennsylvania gent who, who cut off his 
Oh, can we see this? I don't know if we can close up on it. We have a sticker, little, warning, little belief in this Bible is dangerous to your, your health and life. And, um, of course, Jesus talks about amputating certain body parts. And gouging out eyes, I and believe. gouging out eyes, and if your right hand offend, they cut it off. Uh, castration, and we have tragedies happening uh, very frequently where a zealous person, maybe with some mental problems, Mm -hmm. um, follows this teaching because there it is, it's a behavioral grab bag. Well, the polite way that it is said in the New Testament is that there are some who have made themselves eunuchs for the <laughs> kingdom, e and if you're able to receive it, then you can receive it. Where, where can I get one of those stickers, by the From way? From FFRF.org <laughs> shop. And we had a terrible case here in Madison, Wisconsin, where a student <coughs> who felt that he was, had sexual thoughts that he could not control, I mean, I, I think they were just normal, um, as a zealous student, um, in one of the dorms, actually um, cut himself open to take out some of his adrenal glands. Mm -hmm. they, I mean, he he lived, but this, he obviously it was it was the teachings in this book that he thought were he was impure. But so the tragedies that this creates. So literal belief in this book may is endanger dangerous your to health your and life. life. And health. Now you have another. We question. have one more question. Ferdinand Ramos asked, "Isn't stoning someone to death?" considered work, even if they do so on the Sabbath? <laughs> I like the way these people are thinking. <laughs> well, the Numbers 15 doesn't actually say what day they did the actual stoning. <laughs> so maybe they did it on a Monday or Tuesday, which in which case it was perfectly legal to kill somebody. I always I always think of that scene in Monty Python's yeah. Life of Brian when, <laughs> it come, when, you, when you hear the stoning about uh, taking the Lord's <laughs> name. Jeho uh, he said Jehovah. And this, anyway, it's, a, it's a great scene. Go look mm -hmm. it up. But hey, that would be a very good thing to say if someone's about to stone you on a Sunday. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Try it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and unfortunately, we do see this going on, I mean, because these are the Abrahamic religions, which are held in common by the Muslim religion, uh, Jewish, and Christianity. And we do see in some Islamist nations, of course, we still see stonings under, under the Mosaic laws. Absolutely. So I think that wraps it up for our questions today. So again, if you want to learn more about what's wrong with the Ten Commandments, please check out FFRF's non-track. Check out Dan Barker's book, Losing Faith and Faith, and Annie Laurie Gaylor's book, Woe to the Women for the Bible Tells Me So. And tune in next week, same time, same place, for a new Ask an Atheist. And we'll be very glad to take any of your questions. And be on the lookout for ways to submit those questions via video so that we can, you can join us, at least spiritually, in the <laughs> studio. Thanks for tuning in. Thank you.